ZDSA. Uh, it is an international planning, landscape architect, and urban planning firm headquartered in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, with six offices nationally and internationally. I'm now going to turn it over to Keith Weaver, the associate principal with EDSA, and he will introduce the rest of his team. Welcome. <laughs> Great expectations, right? Well, good morning, Baton Rouge. It's wonderful to be here with you all this morning, and I really appreciate you coming out beyond the selection committee here in the second row. All of you that I can see through the lights, I appreciate you being here as well. My name is Keith Weaver. I'm an associate principal with EDSA. Many of you may ask, what does that acronym stand for? That's the first thing I have to usually do to introduce ourselves. And it stands for Edward D. Stone and Jr. Associates. Uh, Edward Jr. was a very good and very well-renowned landscape architect in Florida. I come from the Baltimore office of EDSA, so I'm in the Northeast, but I also work out of the Fort Lauderdale office as well. Occasionally I'll stop today probably to take a drink of water, so I hope you don't mind that. Um, one of the things I wanted to make sure we got a chance to do today is thank BRAF, thanks BRAF's consultant team that they've already select, thank the selection committee for allowing us this time, because it is truly a privilege after you've gone through your first round of selections, to have time with you all today to share our ideas of how to do this process, your design process and planning process. So today what we're going to do is work through an agenda for you that's color-coded and hopefully user-friendly that you'll be able to see um, as we'll follow through our key steps. And so the first step will be our team, your team. That's really how we feel ourselves being on this project. We are not working for ourselves. We're not coming in with preconceived notions. The idea is to be your tools that you use to create the vision, both from a selection committee standpoint and from you, the public, which will eventually be interacting quite a bit if everything goes well. Listening and sharing, that's our public process, where we also listen to you, but you have expectations of us to bring ideas to the table, bring our professional knowledge to the table, and put that with public ideas, so together, and task force ideas, so that together we're creating a plan, we're not dictating a plan, and we'll show you how we're going to do that. Stewardship and sustainability, one of the big things about this project is the health of the lakes. First and foremost, you need to create healthy lakes. Otherwise, you might as well not do this project. So we wanted to make that very top priority, and we have experts to talk about that today. Context sense of analysis and design, that's when we actually start to create ideas. But it's not till well after we have plenty of ideas and issues and opportunities from you all to work on with solutions. Vision to reality, we're going to talk specifically about how you would take the design or plan that we would come up with and what the steps would be, the actions, to move forward for implementation. And then most importantly is community buy-in with you all. It doesn't just end with a presentation, it's a celebration of what the next phases will be after this. And we are the right fit. One of the key things, I won't spend a lot of time on this because the selection committee had an in-depth matter of qualms for EDSA. But for the audience's perspective, we're in our 54th year of, of work. We've always been focused on landscape architecture, planning, and urban design. We do not get into engineering. We do not get into architecture. We've stayed very focused as a firm to be excellent at what we do best. We're an industry leader. We have over 200 awards in waterfronts. Water is a common theme for our projects, whether it's resorts or urban or downtown or a community plan. Most of our projects have water in them in some way. So that's why it's so critical uh, to ourselves. And we've been here before. I don't know how many of you remember me from Old South Baton Rouge or the North Gates or um, the guidelines for the UDOD on Nicholson Drive. We've worked on all of those things. So we're not new to Baton Rouge, even though you may not have heard of us. We were in those processes in 2006 to 2008. Our team members, I wanted to make sure I had on the right of the screen, we have five other people that I couldn't bring with me on the plane today. But we have an expert panel that we put together in our studios, essentially the best of the best from all 12 studios at EDSA, so that we can always have monitoring charrettes with our colleagues. We're video conference, we're WebEx conferenced in, and we do things together. Oftentimes I'm working in Fort Lauderdale to tap some of these people as well as those in our studio. I do have Craig with me here today from our studio. We see ourselves as an extension of the current 
staff that's already been consultants that have already been selected for BRAF. So we have not, we've been very careful not to duplicate that uh, sector of work. And so GEC is water, CPEX, great to work with them for public process again. We did a lot with them in Baton Rouge. And I've worked with Susan Turner Associates as with Susan Turner as a subconsultant in Mobile, Alabama before. Next piece. So how did we get introduced? Well, Mark Goodson and I were good friends from back in the, in the Old South Baton Rouge days when he was with CPEX and such. So when he found out about this project, we, we talked to one another because I've been looking for another great project to do in Baton Rouge because it's one, such a wonderful, and Louisiana, because of planning being so strong here. And so I talked to Mark. We hooked up on a team. And I think he's great from a public, public policy perspective as well. We've got the best of both worlds there. And then we're bringing in environmental scientists from his firm of CB and I. Then I've always been wanting to work with Joey's firm as well, but we've never had a project that went on to implementation in Baton Rouge. This is a perfect one that would go on to implementation. And so EDSA typically has a role reversal at that time where if we are fortunate enough to continue the work and get the original assignment that we're talking about today, you usually flip roles where the local takes the lead on the implementation and we help support that and work back and forth. And then Dr. Jim Richardson, he's famous from what I understand. How many people don't know Dr. Jim? <laughs> Okay, we wanted to have, make sure that we had a, an economist, but also somebody that understood it, budgeting and funding in the statewide system of Louisiana. So I did not bring in an economist from elsewhere. I wanted somebody here that understood Louisiana law, Louisiana legislation, and Louisiana economics, because a lot of this is gonna be done with, within that realm. Next slide. Oh. So our complimentary addition, I think one of the key things you need to note is although we've got eight people up here, it's four teams, we're lean and efficient. You already had three on board, you add four more, that's seven plus BRAF, plus the CPEX and everybody else. So we thought that was plenty. I just wanted you to know a little bit, you can read the first two lines yourself. I worked on plenty of waterfronts, for, but for those of you that don't know me as a person, Look at these bottom photos, and I know it's a little hard, but I live in an Olmstead neighborhood of Sudbrook Park in Baltimore. It's one of three neighborhoods that Olmstead did. I say that for the neighborhood people that are in the audience as well, because when I toured your neighborhoods, they're much like the vernacular of my home here. 1909 is mine, and I wanted you to know I serve on a landmarks committee, I understand historic preservation, and I am part of that in the neighborhood. I think that will be a valuable resource for you as residents also, knowing context sensitivity is very important. And I'm an avid fisherman, I mean sports fisherman, so I really get into whether the aquatics of a lake can work, working with our environmental folks. I've also brought Craig Stoner, who is the project manager on the project. So I'll be the key contact. Craig will be the project manager in charge of production and coordination with all these groups. And Craig has worked with me in Lake Charles as well as a number of other locations. He's probably one of the top 10 project managers in EDSA of 200 people. So I wanted to make sure you're getting one of the finest on this project. And I get to take a breath, Mark's gonna talk. One of the key things I didn't say real quick is I trust this team so much that we're sharing this presentation today rather than me just giving you the whole thing. I wanted everybody to participate with that. Go ahead. One of the distinct advantages that we think this team brings is coupled with the vast global perspective and expertise and experience that EDSA can provide, we've got, we feel, a team that has uh, local knowledge and in-depth experience here that, that no other team can provide. Uh, I'm Mark Goodson, I'll be the, uh, the local liaison here and one of the uh, task activity managers for the project. I've lived here for over 15 years, I'm a sweaty guy up there with the three <laughs> adorable kids. Any weekend you can probably find me uh, running the lakes. Uh, Joey Furr is on the team, lived here for most of his life, has spent most of his life enjoying uh, the lakes themselves. He's the, uh, in the black and white photo, the young, strapping, intrepid looking uh, designer there. He actually worked on the first plan for the lakes uh, back in the 80s. Dr. Jim Richardson, many of you know, longtime resident here, the state's leading economist, uh, and also an LSU professor. So he brings that connection to campus that also we think is a real advantage for our team. He's also a member of a polar bears club that jumps in the lakes every day on New Year's Day, or every year rather on New Year's Day. Uh, I made that up, but uh, <laughs> hopefully you see that, that we bring along with the core competencies a real understanding of all the dynamics that, that are at play here within Baton Rouge. We understand the importance of the lakes to this community. And moreover, we're vested uh, as citizens here in wanting to see the lakes 
become healthy, vibrant again uh, from an environmental perspective, but also enhance what they already bring to the community in terms of you know, recreational amenities and the value that they bring to the surrounding neighborhoods. I think I'm back up again. Briefly, I skipped over one thing and I apologize. Those totes that we gave you are not just lo lovely suitcases for you to use. Um, they're intentionally, one of the key things that we do at EDSA is we publish a magazine every year, not about our projects, but about thought leadership and new things, new advances, new trends and such. So we put this in your packet for you. You asked for a brief summary of one of our reports, which is Lehigh Riverfront. You'll see that in your packet as well when you deliberate this afternoon. And also you'll see a copy of this presentation, so I appreciate that you're all taking notes and not thumbing through that right now, which is great. Um, and then we have one more piece later on that we'll give you. As far as structure, the key things that I wanted to hit with this overall diagram, I know it's a little bit hard to read. The main thing is that EDSA is right there in the middle. I think you can make that out. And we're the number one point of contact on this project. We're going to have three activity leaders in each one of the disciplines that we're talking about. So essentially we have four tracks running in parallel, planning and urban design, detailed landscape architecture that you've asked for on this project in the way of gateways and wayfinding and such. We have environmental design, but also public policy and governance on this project, which Mark's playing both of those roles. And then we also have economics and implementation strategy on this project. So all four of us feed up to John Spain. Before I've done this, where the plan goes over to John Spain. Instead, the way we see it is we report to John Spain after dialoguing with the three green teams, which are the consultants of BRAF right now that you've already selected, CPEX. And each one of us will be likely a liaison, me with CPEX, Mark with um, GEC, working with the water quality aspects, and Joey with STA, Susan Turner Associates, just to help that dialogue. Keep going, that's fine. We can go back to that if you have questions. I'm not going into this, believe me. But what I wanted to remind you of is in the, in the proposal, you asked us for a Gantt chart. The Gantt chart became enormous because we broke this down into incredible detail for you all. So we did our own Excel chart to help elaborate on the process. And now what we're doing is we created for today, to be more user friendly, a visual of how the plan process really breaks down. The way we would start is looking at all the documents, all the plans, and basically doing a gap analysis and an overlap analysis of what's already been done for the lakes. What community input has all been, already been in place. And then we would take that and create four assessments, one from physical, from our perspective, one from a trails perspective, from Joey's perspective, a very detailed look at the lakes, one from an environmental and transportation perspective, and one from an economic funding and uh, implementation perspective. All of those will be analysis assessments. Next slide, or next piece, pardon me. From there, we will start to create concepts, two to three different concepts likely, not just one, multiple ones, because the idea is to work with the public to sift down what ideas they like and dislike from what they told us about issues and opportunities earlier. The second level of concepts are the detailed concepts that Joey would work on for very specific things you asked about, gateways, wayfinding, signage, and such. And then those would boil down to three concepts overall, maybe two, maybe three, no limit necessarily right now, to a final preferred concept after we have vetting and sifting with the public and with the selection committee, advi advisory committee, pardon me, eventually we won't have a selection committee, we'll have an advisory committee. And then we'll have an executive summary document, much like the Lehigh example that I've given the selection committee today, within and created out of a larger report, typically. Joey's going to talk briefly about this. One of the things that um, we wanted to, to do in, in, in terms of the, the project is that since we do have such a local influence as well as the national, more of a global sphere, uh, 635 Main Street is our office. When we redeveloped this office many years ago, we consciously provided space for charrettes, public meetings, uh, and, and common use. So we're designating this space as the, as the Lakes Resource Center. Uh, the, the idea is that this is where we can have team meetings, this is where we can have uh, uh, sh stakeholder meetings. Uh, we plan to take the gallery space and paste all the work product for the, for the, uh, for the project that will be there for the duration of the project. So if a public wants to come in and see something in the middle, we'll, be, we'll have an open door policy. 
uh, as well as having uh, desktops for when EDSA comes in, they'll have their own place to work. And we'll have a lot of, uh, it'll be kind of the war room for the project. And it's, it's a couple blocks from the, the BRAF headquarters, so that, that's very convenient. Uh, and it's, it's worked, it's functioned this way uh, on several projects that we work for. Uh, we've used it and we believe it's going to be an asset uh, at no additional cost to the project. It's just, it's just a, a space that we feel like will become kind of control central for the, for the work. running behind. So. Yeah. One of the key things we wanted to make sure you understood is from an advisory perspective, a committee perspective and the BRAF group's perspective, early on we would set up a coordination setup for that. But ultimately we see this as a round table where all the, all the task force representatives that here, the advisory committee, would feed into the Lakes Master Plan. This is our litmus test forum essentially for things that are going to come forward out of the process and see and test ideas with both the task force and our, our, the public. So for each one of those task force members, or, or advisory committee members, we have either consultant team members that are already on board through BRAF, or ourselves, each tackling one of those topic areas. And the idea that we would, one of the early meetings we would have is ask the advisory committee how they would best like us to use their time not necessarily dictating how to do it, but we'd work with them to best figure out how, in, in Allentown, Pennsylvania, we organized groups around topic areas and they wanted to stay in those topic areas for the entire time versus being in every group or talking about everything. They felt like we could get farther that way. Next slide, please. From a level two perspective, we're gonna have many traditional public forums that you might be used to, a town hall forum. One of the things you may not be used to is a one week forum. I know when Andres Twani was here, he had something like that when you did your downtown plan as well. But we would envision doing a community charrette week, and then our third visit would be an open house, and our fourth visit would be a true final presentation and celebration of the hopeful consensus plan for everybody. But we would use those techniques, and every forum that we would use, in addition to stakeholder meetings and focus group meetings and such, would be documented in a form that would not necessarily be part of the report, it would be an appendix to the report, because it'll get lengthy. But it's important that we, ha we would have standards for how that would be done. Next slide. And these are just some of the techniques. You can see how big into fishing I am, out there with a shirt and tie interviewing fishermen. But I was even doing that around the lakes this weekend over at Campus Lake, and it's very informative. Just sit down with folks, start talking with them, see where, why it's good fishing, bad fishing in an area, things like that. But these are a number of different techniques in our typical workshop forums that we would use to get the ideas on paper, but also encourage people to use um, gaming and such to actually have some fun with the planning, not just words all the time. Next slide. And it's becoming very important for that. So, go ahead, Joe. Like we said before, EDSA has already been here. They've had some success with the public outreach project, uh, process and with producing plans that have really served as a catalyst for a lot of the projects that are going on on the Nicholson cor Corridor, the water campus, and so forth. And it all went back to engaging the public and coming up with good plans. So they've, they've been here before and they've had success. Personally, our firm, being involved with North Boulevard, Bartown Square, we did an extensive uh, public outreach. That project was really more about what was going to happen in the programmed events that the DDD was going to be able to do there than it was just a physical design. So we had many, many public meetings uh, and, and a lot of stakeholder meetings and, and really developed a project that has really become a catalyst, too, for some of the redevelopment on the riverfront, as well as Perkins Road Park uh, to, to bring that recreational asset to, to, to the forefront. Other than the traditional level three, uh, you know, there's, there's a new, even since Town Square, things are, are, are changing. Now interactive uh, situations where we have demonstration blocks and we get people to come and they have fun. We get young and old and uh, single and, and retired and uh, unmarried together and everybody comes together as a community. And then of course, this computer that we all have in our pocket these days has really affected things. So we, we look at Facebook and Snapchat and, and Twitter and how that can really be turned into not only input uh, into, the, into the process and gaining the input of the public, but also after the project is finished. When the plan is finished, if people have been engaged at this level of social media, then that helps to keep the project moving because it, it's always a real time. The old book that goes on a shelf doesn't happen because 
we can tweet and we can, we can post YouTube, we can continue the momentum that we've, we've, desi we've designed. So that'll be used, the, the better block, demonstration block uh, that, that was done was extremely successful. We intend to use this type of, um, this type of uh, work with CPEX to really engage the public and keep it moving forward. One of the things that we wanted to make sure we did is at least brought to you a look at the lakes. We did not in any way want to come in saying it's already figured out, but what we wanted to show is I've taken over 700 pictures out here, which you're welcome to have regardless of the outcome today. <laughs> Um, because it's important to look at it with incredible detail. We noticed incredible differences between these different zones around the lake, and we've done our best in our proposal to the advisory committee and to the selection committee, pardon me, to outline different districts. And oftentimes we'll take this type of approach to the public and meet with people in each of those zones because they'll have unique user needs or a unique uh, needs because you're in a residence versus a church that backs up to the waterfront. Totally different circumstances. So we think we've identified a number of different user groups already. Couldn't put them all in this show today, but essentially there's a series of different groups and we've already worked with the Old South Baton Rouge, which that is the hardest lake to get to, Crest Lake, trying to get through McKinley High School to get to the other side of that area, um, in that area. So we'll go to the next slide for a moment. One of the things we've also put in our proposal is a series of philosophies and visions. You asked us to envision you know, what's important about the project uh, for us. And I think one of the key things is creating a unified vision, adapting to demographic trends, that's exactly why Jim is on the project, establishing a sense of community, not having disparate parts around the lake, which it really is that way now, depending on where you are, and how you unify the whole theme depending on where you are. Uh, creating a memorable experience. There are absolutely memorable experiences out there in key locations, Wampold Park, Campus Lake and such, but how you maximize the experience for the entire lakes is important, especially coming in from the I-10 gateway, which is very anticlimactic at this point. And then focusing on the details. Even at this time, when we're planning, we'd be thinking about the details and how you move forward, because otherwise you're costing things that you don't know what quality you want as we do our action plan strategy. And this is Mark. Thank you. Sorry. Just as important that we do right by the public through this process is that we do right by the environment. As Keith mentioned earlier, we've got to get uh, the lake system healthy in order for this to be uh, an amenity for the community for, for years and years to come. Uh, we propose creating a pathway to sustainability, and that's really part of the specialty that CB&I brings to the table. We've got some other team members here at the audience. I just want to acknowledge Glenn and Chelsea, if you can stand up, folks who will also be working on this project as uh, activity leaders. Uh, we promote creating that pathway to sustainability, um, one that will you know, reestablish or create new natural systems, restore the lakes back to their natural vitality, and also enhance the experiences that people have, the opportunities that they have to interact with nature. We're going to do that by collecting data that we need, working with GEC and STA and the other great consultants uh, that BRAF's already providing, not to duplicate effort, but making sure that we're getting a good base layer of data that we need in order to analyze the existing conditions, everything from existing uh, shoreline edge to boat ramps, weirs, and other infrastructure, how much noise and runoff is coming off the I-10 bridge, for example. All of that needs to be looked at um, in order to get a, a handle on the, the current conditions of the lake system itself. And then the other is engaging the community. We've, we've, we've talked about the public process a lot. It's going to be a thread you know, that runs through everything we do, but using such a great resource like CPEX, it's going to be important to touch you know, every community and stakeholder that has a role along the lakes, they all have a part to play in the sustainability. Even if you're a homeowner whose backyard backs up to the lakes, it's going to be important for you to know what you can do to help mitigate runoff and other things that can ultimately affect the environmental health of the lakes themselves. Tyler Thigpen is with us. She's going to be our lead environmental scientist on this team, and she's going to talk a little bit about what goes into creating a healthy lake system. Good morning. I just want to say that this is a, an important project to me because I live near the lake, so I have a professional and a personal interest in this. Um, we understand that good neighbors are very important to an urban lake system. Um, reducing pet waste and lawn chemicals that run into the lake is very important. So neighbors can implement backyard wildlife gardens, rain gardens, wetlands to help filter those waters. And there are programs such as the National Wildlife Federation's Backyard Wetland Garden that we can help 
um, talk to landowners about and, and get implemented in that transitional space between the lawn and the lakes. And in addition to being great buffers and filters, wetlands are also essential to wildlife. They're um, home, refuge, water, and so we understand that for a healthy lake, we need a balanced wildlife ecosystem, and, and that's for the enjoyment of the community as well. Bird watching, um, photography, fishing, all of those are important in seeking a balanced wildlife community. And then um, also depth. We'll work with the GEC for different depths and underwater shelving to create fish breeding habitats and better fishing opportunities for the public. Um, trees, of course, are important for everybody in the shade, in the um, sun and the heat of South Louisiana. So that's good for wildlife as well as the community and we'll work to plant native species along the shoreline. And um, again, you, the community is the most important part of all of this in an urban lake setting. So we understand that. And again, we'll work with the GEC to use the spoil for beneficial use and plant native species along the shoreline and that interface of the water and the lawns and the ground. And um, also just overall habitat restoration, all that ties into habitat restoration and getting the lakes to a more natural state. And I think that's it for me. It's, it's also very important that we enhance the natural environment uh, with new opportunities for folks to interact with nature and, and transportation and parking is going to be key to providing that access as well as mitigating the effects on the natural environment. Just briefly in your handout, you'll have an example from EDSA that you did not have in the proposal of a natural wilderness refuge that we've actually worked on in the Wilmington, Del Delaware Riverfront. It's called the Russell K. Peterson Wildlife Refuge and it involves the DuPont Foundation as well working on that. Next slide. So we've got five minutes left here, so we're going to just briefly hit one of the key things you have to look at at the health of the lakes. You also have to look at the physical design of the lakes and make sure that you establish value judgments along the way for what our quality uh, environments and how we make decisions about what should stay, what should go, who do we how do you best listen to one person's value versus another person's value? And we're going to have to make those tough decisions along the way with you. Next slide, Julie. One of the key things that we'll do is an inventory and analysis with a multiple layer a natural and man-made system. Keep slide. Go ahead, Julie. And then we'll layer these different analyses of systems along the lakes, transportation, pedestrian systems, natural systems and such, into a very sophisticated uh, graphic technique for creating, uh, so you can see the relationships between them rather than all in one plan. Next slide. We will also um, develop a matrix format. Rather than all being physical drawings, we'll take the public's comments and track them through the entire process so that you can take issues and opportunities and put solutions with those as well, and we can show how they're moving forward as ideas. Next slide. And then we're going to create a series of alternative scenarios that we'll bring to you that you can vet with us and create uh, sifting in that area. As project manager for uh, the project, um, it's going to be my role to really help coordinate uh, a lot of the work with, with our team and as well as, be, as the client group. And some of the options, some of the alter, uh, ways of, of those techniques is showing some of the plan graphics. But we also found that, that 3D renderings and 3D even uh, vignettes really show a lot of depth and things you can't get out of plans and, and sections that, were that the design world's used to that really show much better in a public forum, show sustainability, show different, uh, different materials, different pieces. And then also going through some animations where people can really touch and feel and see what it's going to really look like in the end. At this time, with the two minutes that we have remaining, what I want to do is take the luxury of having Jim come up for two and Mark for their last two minutes to talk about implementation with you. It's really important. Okay. I think that you saved the best for last. Keep going. So <laughs> we'll come Here, back to design if you need to. The issue is paying for it. There are two obviously capital expenses, upfront expenses we have to worry about. You got you have possible grants federal grants, their private foundations have grants, you have, then you have to worry about maybe long-term bond issues, you have to worry about state and local activities, you have a whole host of things, you have to put them down, it's part of the game, you can't do something for free, unfortunately. Then the next step, you make the capital investments, you got to maintain, 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 keep it moving, so we have to have two elements that are going together, one, how do we afford it, 
How do we do it at first? And that information also needs to go back into as we start thinking what we want to do. We can't be ignorant of or uninformed about the potential cost involved. Just a two-way street as we go through all these community involvements, and we have a tremendously diverse community we have to deal with, and we appreciate that. Ultimately, we believe this plan will be judged, uh, its success will be judged on its implementation. So part of what we want to be able to provide is, is uh, opportunities and, uh, for funding to help see this plan through based on the priorities that uh, you helped guide us uh, to determine in terms of implementation. Uh, and we'll be putting together an implementation ma matrix that literally ties uh, the whole process in from the ideas and concerns we hear to the projects that are prioritized uh, at the end and, and funding sources to help implement those projects to make sure this project, overall project, gets, gets done. And the key thing is to have a celebration at the end of this all, that it rolls up into a final celebration and that we have options. We believe firmly in a master plan with options built into it, as you'll see in our Lehigh master plan. It's not just one final picture. You can have options for each of the seven or eight zones that we talked about that still carry forward in the master plan depending on the funding that's available in the future. What we've just given you is a handout that we custom made for you today to, to emphasize our team advantage. And we're done at this time, so we can talk about that through Q&A, but we wanted you to see a summary of some items beyond what we gave you in the proposal as well. And we appreciate the time today and the 30 minutes that we jammed together. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll lead into Q&A. Much of the discussion and work on this project will deal with the dredging part and what we do with the spoil and whether we do it wet or dry and what are the ramifications for the community depending on which decision we make. You all have not really addressed that. Is that because you think that's GEC's job or do you have some ideas about what your preferences might be, how we might use that spoil? I think part of it is we, we ran out of time in our presentation. Uh, it's something that we have certainly thought through. Obviously, we need to know the makeup of the spoil and what its potential is from an you know, environmental standpoint. But I think our plan is to use it uh, on site to the extent we can, both for habitat restoration, things creating slope and other things, but also hopefully uh, to add to the recreational amenities. There are areas where there aren't uh, paths for bikeways and pedestrians. You could potentially use fill. Uh, for that purpose and also you know we'd like to look at where are catalyst sites for investment that Phil could help add to where we could bring new investment and amenities to this area as well as perhaps provide some services for the surrounding neighborhoods that aren't currently there. In addition to um, handling the the spoil that is there today then the dredging that needs to occur have you given any thought to um, working with the sediments and modifying how sediments are transported through the lake or reducing the amounts of sediments to get into the lake? Yeah, I mean, one of the big problems with the lakes right now is that they're really stormwater management quality ponds for the Corporation Canal. So they intercept everything, and some of your cleanest water might be going through the Corporation Canal from the lakes coming out, as opposed because of the skimmers and such that are there. So we think that in the big scheme of things, one of the things you have to, might have to look at is what I call this causeway effect that's happening past Crest Lake and University Lake and City Park Lake and the main lake. In the future, if you really have an open slate to think about for right now until we get to costing, John, um, you might want to connect some lakes and not have distinct lakes that are acting as stormwater ponds for the main lake. You may actually want to connect them to create a healthier lake. And that will also play into how you would locate spoil in those cases. In some cases, you may put in bridges rather than causeways that are essentially out there today. So that's one of the thoughts that we had given it without putting an idea out there too far. But that's and, a if, big and if I can amplify on that please. just a bit, I would say I think that's going to be key to sourcing some of the funding yeah. that may be available for implementation here is tying it you know, to the larger issues surrounding stormwater management and how can we look at it as a larger system and how can we mitigate the runoff and the sediment that's moving into and through the my, lake system. Real quick, my observation, and we want to go through these quick, but this is really important. Every single piece of paving for LSU or others around and the neighborhoods and the roads feeds into these lakes right now. There's no intercepting rain gardens. There's no filtration. So 
half of your study has to be about how to intercept this water and rethink about parking lots and things like that and things you can do as prevention measures before it even gets to the lakes. So it's really more than the lakes. It's all these edges and beyond and working with LSU and the neighborhoods and such. I hope that helps. Yes, sir. Uh, Brian Harmon, Public Works. Uh, one of our big issues, obviously, is uh, dealing with the dredge materials. But the other issue that's come up, and it was really what killed the project in the past, were the cypress logs and the stumps. You know, how those can be dealt with in this whole process. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't. Cypress logs and the stumps. Oh. Correct, sir? Yes. I think we'll have to, once we get into it, we get more information from GEC, we'll have to, you know, work together to determine the best way to, to address that. There are certainly multiple options for how you work through those, how you dredge the lakes themselves. CBNI has a great deal of experience, both in coastal and canal and lake work, in terms of developing dredge plans. So that's something that we, we would work with GEC uh, to find the best solution, the most cost-effective uh, solution for uh, once we have that information. My and first Brian. impression looking at the lakes right now is that where some of those are could actually be your estuarial zones. Mm -hmm depending on how you go back in and regrade around it. You may not even dredge those areas. You may dredge deeper in some areas and not so deep. We'd have to work with GEC to see what they're recommending other than the materials we've been given to date. But we could see those in our, in my area, Chesapeake Bay, we've, we subplant those with wetlands and such and leave them intact and you go deeper elsewhere. So. Brian, we also realized that the, the dredge that was done in, in the 80s, that was one of the, one of the issues was it wasn't successfully managed and taken care of, and that's not only affected the, the health of the lake drastically, but it also affects the recreational opportunities. One thing we haven't talked much about in terms of the trails plan are paddling trails and the ability to use the surface of the water. That's possibly the most underused recreational resource of the entire lake system. Uh, while we can, intrude, we can improve trail paths and sections where we, we're separating runners and bikers from, from traffic, uh, access to the lake and all of the program groups I is important, but right now you can't sail a boat because you may hit a stump and, and, and sink. So, uh, and th so y y we, we have to deal with that uh, in, in a way, and I think that the team definitely realizes that. I have one question, I guess. It's almost a health question, I guess. Uh, this was a Cypress Tupelo swamp, and so one of the reasons it was drained and made into the form it is was because of concern of mosquitoes. And if we're developing wetland areas, and obviously we're going to be making breeding grounds for mosquitoes. And so are there ways through your experiences that you've addressed those? I know this is South Louisiana, and this is a gigantic concern. Well, obviously, there are always mosquitoes uh, associated with water down here. But if we have a more balanced ecosystem and a healthy fish population and the predator-prey relationship that a natural lake should have, um, then we're going to have a little more control on that issue. We the lakes are just so unhealthy right now that um, improving the water quality and, and building up that balance of wildlife will really help with the mosquitoes. And there will all be, always be mosquitoes, of course, but um, that will help, certainly. The other thing that we've seen is in areas where we're creating amenities like that, wetlands, is we don't necessarily take the public through them anymore. So there's going to be a major discussion it has to happen on this project of where should the public go and not go because of some of that. And not that it wouldn't impact residents nearby and such as well. But if we're talking about the users, trying to keep it down, I mean, most of your plant material out there is lawn and elephant ear. And uh, we think you need a whole variety of things, in, even in between there, that aren't even wetland plants. So there's things we can do that aren't necessarily just wetlands in the water to help with that. But in the future, everybody may not traverse where they are today, op open freely walking, because it might be better to steer them elsewhere. Danny Mahaffey, LSU. Can you describe how you will manage the design process during the uh, design charrettes? You talked a lot about it, a, a whole one-week charrette. Uh, can you go in a little bit more detail on that, please? Usually what we like to do is on the first day coming in, on that Monday, we would have a session with both BRAF and the um, advisory committee and present to them some initial um, feedback that we would also go to the public on the second night with. So we're always meeting with the task force or the advisory committee when we're meeting with the public is the idea. But the intent that week is to have it twice. Once at the beginning of the week, we're presenting back what we've heard 
not solutions yet, but just uh, framing whether these are the right goals, visions, issues, and opportunities that we're going to work with for the week. So there's a reaffirmation at the beginning of the week from what we've been working on before. By the end of the week, we'll, we'll have been working in the gallery all week, and people can come in there if they want. At scheduled times is what I'd like to do, so we have lots of time to work, and we've done this very well before. By the end of the week, we would invite the public back to then, so we'd use the public charrette not only to reaffirm early in the week, but to give us ideas and solutions. That's when we start to bring our ideas and solutions forward during that week too, but not with some prescribed plans that they're picking from yet. By the end of the week, we'd have ideas drawn, maybe two or three different concepts of how to approach different areas of the lake. It may not be the whole lake, but at least it's addressing solutions in different areas. And we would have a public presentation, either a pin-up or in the gallery even, or if it's not big enough there, then we'll bring everything to another venue if we need to. And as far as the, as far as the further down to the development of design uh, and meeting with the public, uh, we, we've envisioned uh, what we're calling pop-up water stations where we're going to actually go out you know, on nice days when there are a lot of users there and, and put, put up a pop-up and have the actual users stop while they're in the mid-stride of working on the lake to re get their emotions get their feedback. There's always a certain amount of education that you have to do to explain to them what we're doing. So if we can educate, what we're, educate the public as to what we're doing, uh, then they can give us you know, real-time feedback right there. We'll do that two or three times so that, and that'll affect uh, kind of the creations of the plan. We'll be able to work with the, the runners groups and we'll be able to, to, to work with you know, the, the rec, LSU rec and, and those that, which we've had uh, associations with in the past. So I think the user groups and then the actual user have to be interfaced really at that level of, of how it's going to be. Now we've got to make sure that the people that are providing programs out there are, uh, are, are spoken for, but it, we also, just the person who decides to, to, to go take a run on the lake, if he's come in town for a meeting and he wants to run the lake, we want to know what the different, the different people say. Go ahead, ma'am. Yes, I'm Carolyn McKnight with Breck, and I have a sort of a two-part question. Uh, what would you do to bring uh, to this process that would wow the community and capture the imagination of the people in this region and then what would something iconic be uh, because I've used a lot of walking and biking trails in my time and I just would like to know what would set this project and this lake apart from all of those projects. I didn't talk to it because of time but the sapphire necklace concept that we had you might wonder where that came from. You need a brand for the, which you've started for Destination the Lakes. We saw a byline, almost like a movie premiere, of the sapphire necklace, much like the emerald necklace that I wrote about in the proposal in Olmsted's Day in Boston. It's on that order of magnitude that I've toured it. It's huge, what you have here. The wow factor could be, instead of an edge experience here, which that's all you have, all I can appreciate the lakes from are from edges, would be to build an island and build boardwalks to that island and have your aviary out in the middle of that island so it's protected and keep people away from it when you don't need it there. I mean, this is dramatic, I know, so you may or may not like it, but the idea would be really transition it so you can experience the lake from within looking back out. You have to traverse the whole four to five miles to appreciate the skyline from the other side. And by, honestly, I got in my car to drive around to appreciate it because it was a long, hot day the other day. So. <laughs> But I think that would really bring something special to the area. But you will get notoriety as soon as you clean it. And you can have fish species without having to stock it every year or every couple years. Another yeah. thing I think it, that we, we didn't talk about is it, are the gateways and, and the, the yeah. wayfinding uh, and really the trail plan. We see that as all one, one piece that has to work together. We've got to deal with, with safety issues, we've got to deal with accessibility issues, but we also got to deal with uh, creating that entrance to the district and, 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 and creating a, uh, a gateway system, not just at the, the Dalrymple exit on 110, but also potentially at Stanford as it comes into, and, and, and looking at Corporation Canal and what is that set up. That's not only a great opportunity for a gateway, but it's a great opportunity for a, an extended recreational opportunity from the rec as well as the campus. Uh, and tying through in terms of greenways. And so how these other greenways that, 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 that are being developed, how those tie into the greater parish, and as they come into the Lakes District, if you will, how do we announce that? 
is there a vernacular that speaks to uh, or is germane to the neighborhoods or, or the area that, that, that really sets forth of this as part of Baton Rouge, a distinct district, but it ties to all the other and, and the trails work, work through it, whether it's on the water or on the, on the land. Um, Connie Betts with the Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development. Um, my question is, Louisiana is home to a vast amount of species and a pit stop for millions of migratory birds. How can we improve the habitat around the lakes and what are some opportunities for strengthening flora and fauna? I think stabilizing the shore and just creating that interface of wetlands um, where the water meets the lawn is going to do a lot. Having native species and and a place for species that are juvenile or aren't equipped to live in an open lake system. They need those fringe habitats. And so that'll do a lot in the way of bringing in birds and um, passerines and different animals that you're not gonna see in an open lake system. You'll see wading birds and frog species and all sorts of stuff that'll utilize wetlands if you build it. And um, really it's about bringing in, you have the hydrology, you just need the plants and the native species. and, and you'll see wildlife will flock to that if you build it. From the people's perspective though, when I've worked in Manchester, New Hampshire, we had to work around eagle rookeries. I've worked in Chesapeake Bay on the chop tank around nesting sites. You cannot have people come close to those areas that you want to have aviaries in because they're, they, you want them to roost, you want them to stay on for a while. And I think the problem here right now, honestly from my perspective is people are everywhere. They're not controlled, with the exception of the LSU bird aviary right now. Everybody's everywhere, and they're making noise, and you know, film crews are setting up tents in the park and things like that, like they were this weekend. And so that's going to chase that waterfowl away. It's not going to, I mean, the most respite area I saw was the campus lake when you go back to the back uh, around the halls. And it's very quiet back where all the willows are there and such. That was one of the best quiet places right now because students weren't in session. <laughs> but I'm sure it's one of the most hectic, getting from the halls to the Ag Center and such. So you're never gonna really get that to happen during those seasons until we correct that people can't get everywhere necessarily. You have to kind of divide those up a little bit, but you wanna appreciate it. Sorry for the long answer, but I just think that's important from the people side too. Yes, sir. Understanding that you want, you know, be um, the implementer of the plan, but also understanding that no plan will actually work without uh, having given a whole lot of thought in, um, so you dream it, yeah, but you got to pay for it. I know Dr. Richardson is well familiar with, um, you know, some options, and I, I would presume that whatever happens to drainage or, you know, uh, water and whatever happens to the spoil somewhat, somewhat imp uh, impacts uh, how this is going to be paid for, but if you could speak to some of the options for, um, implementation and paying for the ultimate plan? Well, I think the <clears throat> you start with the plan that is at the, at the very beginning how you might finance it. And as I said in my comments, the relatively, there are only so many buckets of money that you have to deal with, but you, I think you have to be creative. And first you have to have the right government structure that says, so this, is how, this is how we're gonna oversee this thing. Second step is, okay, where do we look for funding? Then you find, you find in the federal government a very large source of grants from different departments, all the way from EPA, Department of Energy, all the way down to HUD, and then to Commerce, and even to the interior. So there are all sorts of possible grants that will help you do some of this. And then you have, obviously, outside foundations that have interest in environmental issues as well. Then you come back and you say, okay, then at some point, what, do, what is it that we have to match somehow? How do we do that? Then you talk about, yes, you have to work, use that T word tax once in a while, fee possibilities. So, you all, so at, at this time, and, and, until you see exactly what it might look like, it's hard to say, okay, it's A, B, and C. It could be A, D, and F that you have to look. So you're looking, but you have to, but there are only so many places you look. And I, I hope that answer is not too vague for you. But I mean, basically right now, you see what it's going to look like, and then you say, this is where we can go for the money. These are I, 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 per, per, uh, uh, agencies, federal agencies, private foundations, or local agencies that we can look for the money. I think if I can just add to that briefly, 
you know, part of the, su the success with implementation is going to be somebody who, uh, or an agency that will be dedicated and responsible for seeing that it gets done and constantly looking for opportunities for funding. And there are lots of best practices out there. Louisville's Riverfront is well documented in the public benefit corporation that they created there to help fund it and ultimately to program it and see the ongoing operations and maintenance. Likewise, there are all sorts of special assessment districts that can be created to help subsidize either the upfront capital cost or the ongoing operations or both. So there are lots of interesting uh, models out there that our team is well equip equipped to adapt to form a creative solution for how you pay for this project. And it may be phased and it'll have to be prioritized. So we'll work with the stakeholders to say, you know, which part do you want to fund first? I think um, getting the general public on on board too as to what they want and what they they see they're going to be they're going to get is very important in funding uh, if, if it's got the full support of the community so that that public process starts in the funding portion of that is important uh, because we got to we got to design something that we can afford and something that the public wants John you next you talked earlier about eight zones that you've identified potentially around the lakes I wonder if you'd expand your thinking on a couple of specifics one is LSU both owns University Lakes and, and controls a large part of that edge. And with 30,000 plus students on that campus, what amenities do you think can be implemented for their use and at the same time being sensitive both homeowners and uh, the wildlife? And second, the sense of place. When you get off the interstate and you come to Dalrymple, you see the lakes really for the first time, but it's not a very friendly view at places along Dalrymple and other roads that surround the lakes. We've got an interstate that, that penetrates the lakes. Uh, we're, we're talking about trying to create that sense of place. So when you arrive there, you know you're in a special place. Would you kind of expand on those two very different kind of uses that we've talked about the lakes, but let's talk about the traffic. Let's talk about LSU's potential use in a positive way on their portion of the lakes. One of the big discoveries I had for the last few days I've been in Baton Rouge that I didn't realize from my OSBR days is that there were seven churches or so along the lakes which back with parking lots to the lakes. And one of the things I was cautious about when we did our proposal is how much did you push redevelopment or development versus an open space beautification, wetland habitat revitalization plant? And what were you looking for? One of the best opportunities I saw was working with the churches, which are probably leaseholds, if I understand correctly, of the LSU land that is there. And I noticed that the sculling uh, locations or the row locations for storing the skulls is in that location. So I was instantly thinking, how do you create, since there's development that turns its back on the water right there, and churches are not water dependent uses, and I don't want to come out against any churches or anything like that, <laughs> but there's a whole layer there that's deep that you could actually create a boathouse with some concessions, and instead of the gelato stands in the park, you really go full force like our waterfront in Harbor has Rita's and they're small concessions, but they are part of the revenue generating aspect is you bring some revenue generation, real sizable things to the water that help pay for the boathouse or they animate the boathouse. In Lehigh, we were gonna reanimate the boathouse because it was essentially a lake on the riverfront. So that's one of the key areas that I saw as an opportunity there. And also because they're already associating that with uh, sculling. It'd be very hard in the residential areas to do the same thing. From the gateway standpoint, I think Joey should talk about that. I think the that. sense of place uh, is created with starting with the gateways. It's also the, the, the structure of the trail. It's the, the, the wayfinding signage uh, and, and just the general, the, the general appearance of the, uh, of the district. And, and it starts with those, those major gateways. Uh, in terms of LSU, uh, you know, Student Rec, their, with their redevelopment that they're about to go through there, we've, uh, working on that project, have discussed the, the potential to have you know, a boathouse. There's no place for the crew uh, at, at this point. There, there's a lot of things that, that LSU Rec could do on the water surface if the water were, were correct. So that's a tremendous thing. And I, another thing that we always have to talk about is game day. Uh, there's eight times, of year, eight times a year where uh, we have people coming from other places. And I think the, the, you know, with the, the, the situation and the success of the team and the, where people are parking now, I think that, that backs stuff up into, in, into the Lakes District, and I think that's a huge potential, too, to, to consider traffic, but also uh, potential use for, for things that are associated with the university, not just game day, but mainly. We have one minute. Can we get one more question in? Is there another one? Any itching? We do implement projects. We brought projects to show with implementation if we had time. Obviously, we're at the end of our hour together or 40, uh, 55 minutes together. 
But I want you to know that we do implement projects and we do have, please look at that circular that we gave you, that special brochure. And we thank you very much, no, okay, <laughs> that's fine. But we also Absolutely. thank you for your time because we really appreciate after all this work at least getting to share our ideas with you and uh, really appreciate this community. You are valued and you are wonderful in that you have all these resources in Baton Rouge that I can't even get in Baltimore. So you should be very thankful for that. It's amazing. So congratulations to you all. We Please join me in thanking EDSA, ladies and gentlemen.